Great. Well, no my how am I? Welcome to another in conversation um, here at uh, OTBNZ. Um, very pleased to welcome Anita and Sam uh, to our in conversation. So Anita Mitchell is um, a new grad coming out of uh, Dunedin, Otago Poly, and she's four weeks into her first job. Uh, congratulations there, Anita. And Thank you. Sam who's based up in the Hawke's Bay, Napier, uh, works for APM, um, Rehabilitation Services, and you are approaching your second year, I think you said, in, in, in that position as, a, as an OT. So um, in conversation is an in conversation. <laughs> uh, call it what it is. You know, so uh, basically I've got some uh, sort of areas we want to discuss uh, with you both. And then after that, we'll just record the session and place it on our YouTube channel for people to have a look at. Um, so, Anita, perhaps I just start with you. You just graduated. I think the ceremony you said it's in March um, next year. So, tell us what's it been like, warts and all. Uh, so I guess this last year has been the most difficult um, with, with COVID. Um, studying from home I found particularly difficult um, I, because I'm, I'm, I'm an active learner. So I, I found it, um, I, and I really like kanohi ki te kanohi, so that was a bit difficult. But the upside of that is that I could see how hard uh, the Polytech worked to keep us going so that I can graduate. I'm really mm. grateful for that and I really wanted to acknowledge um, the effort and the hard work and because and, there was so much that needed to be put into place quite quickly um, and I think they really early on realised that this was likely was a likelihood that we were going to end up online and so they were setting up systems really early mm. and we just all tried to 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 get through it together mm. so um even though it was it was difficult we made it through um mm. relatively unscathed i think that it was hardest on uh on parents that had children that were at home um in particular um but overall the OT um, training was incredible. It was it was much more than I ever thought it would be. And even though it was very very difficult um, as a as a second chance learner, I guess as a mature student, uh, I I really appreciate all of the learning that that I've had overall. Yeah. So how how did you come to pick OT then as a potential? Um, yep. Yeah, I my mum was really ill and I was living in Australia at the time. So that was probably about five or six years ago now. And so I came back to New Zealand and was, was pretty much in hospital with mum for about a month. And during that time, um, I guess in that health sector, got to, to meet a lot of health professionals and um, they kind of said, you, you seem to fit in around here. <laughs> and, and I was at Waikato Hospital and they were amazing, particularly from a Māori perspective of working in with Fano. Um, and then one day I met a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist and, and um, they were watching me, I didn't know, was working with my mum with her rehab and they were kind of saying, you should, you should look at this sort of mahi. And I, so I asked them what they did and the OT gave me the best answer. <laughs> oh, right. That's good on yeah. that, yes. Yeah. I've, I've often found, because uh, I'm not an occupational therapist, but I often found uh, when you, particularly taxi drivers, there's a good test of, you know, how society thinks of occupational therapy. They say, what do you do? And I say, well, I regulate occupational therapists. And they used to say, yeah, I, I went to a physiotherapist once. And it's like a <laughs> sort of, uh, no sort of, uh, you know, clear picture that the general public has about occupational therapy. It, it, it is sort of not really clearly understood, uh, but it's growing. There are over, now over 3,000 um, occupational therapists mm. on the register with a license. So 
you know, it is moving in the right in the right direction. I just want to go back to your comments about the um, simulation that you have to go through the online learning, um, and a, a number of um, uh, sort of educational institutions seem to be doing this blended approach, what they call blended approach to learning, which is I, my understanding would be some classroom and some online learning. Um, and when we've spoken to students quite recently in Otago, uh, Dunedin, uh, they suggested, yeah, we can understand why it happened during COVID. Uh, but in actual fact, there's no, there's no, um, not excuse, there's no sort of uh, replacement mm -hmm. for going to work, as it were. Uh, that almost hidden curriculum about getting up in the morning and actually physically going to work and communicating with with colleagues, etc. What does that? What would you hold to that? Anita? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And from that, um, there's a whole social side. There's that camaraderie that's um, of of being able to to really share your ideas and and work in a collaborative manner, which is a really um, something that OTs do a lot in the field. Apparently, I'm <laughs> quite new, but um, they say that. Um, the ability to collaborate is is really highly valued in the field, and so you can, it's a really great opportunity to do that at Polytechnic. And I I really like the way that Dunedin does that, where we once a week we do have a large um, I guess lecture where all of the cohort are there, but then after that they break us down into nice small groups um, and, and so you get to form a relationship with that small group and you get to feel quite safe and then you get to, um, to really learn and explore and learn to collaborate and work with different types of people um, in groups of 12 or so, so yeah. yeah, that was really useful. Thank you. So Sam, if I can turn to you now, you're, you're a veteran. Uh, oh, is that what they call us after two years? Outstanding. After, after, after two years, or approaching into two years now. So what's it been like for you? As it was it, you know, what you imagined it to be? Yeah, that's a yeah, a really good question. I think ultimately it ha it has um eventuated how I, I, I thought it would. I think um this coming to the end of my second year in practice, things have clicked certainly far more into gear this year than they, they had last year. Um, I think coming into entering the workforce um, out of placements, like clinical placements, you're adjusting not just to the concepts of your profession, you're, you're adjusting to the context of the workplace and there's, a, there's an increased expectation and demand on you that you hadn't, you had been able to simulate in the past with placements, but not fully experience as a practitioner. Um, so I think the first year, um, a lot of my uh, theoretical models and frameworks were, were put somewhat on the back burner while I kind of went into survival mode, <laughs> you, know? you know, just trying to keep my head afloat in a, in a quite a competitive um, uh, work context, really. Um, but this year, even with the, the struggles that we've all experienced um, with the global pandemic, has, it's been a great year to kind of consolidate a lot of things and really take, like assume an OT role within this place, um, within this workplace, as opposed to um, uh, an, a, a, an, a, an ACC assessor, which is what I'm, I'm accredited as. It's, uh, it's, it's been a lot more about fulfilling an identity as an OT and, and trying to really thrive in the setting instead of just survive. Yeah, that, that, that's good. I'm interested in your comments about the sort of theory practice gap. So, you know, Polytechnic or the program fills you with all the theory and models around, you know, this is how, it, this is how you do it. Mm. And, and then you get into practice, you know, the messy business of practice. And all those things go out, well, I'm assuming, they, you know, they tend to be, as you say, put on the back burner while you struggle with thinking, gosh, how do I, how do, I do the paperwork? How do I... Who do I contact? How do I make the referral? Exactly. Those, all those exactly. sorts of things that sort of, uh, you know, the, the everyday business of being an occupational therapist is something you have to pick up first. But have you gone back to that theory and practice now, do you feel? 
I, I think I have I have a bit. I, I've found that um, just for myself personally, like this this setting is very much around um, sitting down with clients and their employers and negotiating a way to help them back to work as sustainably as possible. So like when you're talking about things like um, like the model of human occupation and volition and, 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 and truly understanding what motivates people, this is all incredibly relevant, relevant content. Um, but I think that um, it kind of comes at odds quite regularly with some of the ACC frameworks, like particularly I, that's been my experience where, where you set timeframes on things and you, you work towards deadlines. And, um, and frankly, you're working towards objectives and goals that the client may not want. This is, may come as a shock to many, but a lot of, there are people out there that don't want to return to work and, and, and wish to remain off work. So there are, there are uh, challenges with um, navigating that as a new grad, particularly. Yeah. Like in, in OT um, the school, uh, there are great principles around client-centeredness and clients being directed with their own rehab. And this is fantastic stuff. Like we know that in order to get people to follow through with goals, it's best if they set the goals themselves. It's objective, it's known. But um, uh, there is a uh, a bit of a, a discrepancy coming into this kind of work between being client-centered and being client-led. Like, yeah. like we're, we, you, it, it's a very delicate thing to balance. Um, I think that's been honestly my biggest challenge as an yeah. integrate coming into this kind of setting. I, for sure. I don't think that's unusual because from mm. our position on, on the board and as the registrar, I see um, complaints coming to me or, you know, discussions that take place, mm. particularly with ACC. Practitioners are working for ACC. Who's the client? Who am I working for? Am I working for the client? And all those wonderful things you said about, you know, getting people involved mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. their care and leading their care. Or am I working for ACC? And there's a tr clear tension there between those two competing energies or, or requirements. Um, and I think you're alluding to that when you say, mm -hmm. you know, some people don't want to adhere to a particular time frame where they have to be able to walk to work or you know mm. work for two hours and then come home is that is that am i getting that oh you've uh, and that, and hit the nail on the head uh, absolutely um uh, and what i've enjoyed about um coming into this setting as an ot um as opposed to to another profession like a physio and um, i work with some incredible physios that do some fantastic work but what I've really enjoyed, um, I, was, I was very fearful initially, especially coming into next year. I mean, we did some, I mean, Nita will remember as well, we did some great anatomy and physiology and um, some real kind of health specific uh, health science um, education. But my anatomy and physiology knowledge compared to my physio colleagues is chalk and cheese. Like they, they run rings around me. Um, and I was, oh gosh, I don't know my ATFL ligament from my patella ligament. Like how am I going to thrive in a, a physical health setting? Um, but people are so complicated and, and really we are working way outside of the scope of just a physical injury. There are so many things tied to, tied to injuries. It's a loss of roles, it's a, um, loss of identity it's it's um uh, out of routine and uh, like what anita was talking about before with her classmates like your work is is a source of so many things beyond payment or at least it should be like you can um it's about collegial relationships it's about um having purpose and meaning it's like all of these different things so this is the scope that's all very familiar with ot's and and these things are the most important things when supporting people back to work. Like it's by addressing these things, have I helped support people back to work as opposed to focusing on an ankle sprain. This takes three weeks to heal if you do exercises A, B and C. It's, yeah, it's it's made me really appreciate the, the roles that OTs have so, in this kind of area. So if you're working alongside uh, physiotherapists, then the approach that they take to rehabilitating somebody is very different to yours, I would imagine. Mm. Mm. So how do you decide, do you decide which client you're going to get? Or, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in this setting here, um, we 
uh, even our physios tend to work more like OTs. It's quite it's quite curious because we like a lot of physio clinics will have a very um, hands-on, maybe like a massage-based approach where a client sees them two or three times a week and they're receiving manual-based therapies. Or um, Here at, at APM, um, we tend to take more, in many cases, I'll speak for us here in Hawke's Bay because the company is quite large as a whole, um, but we take a very hands-off approach with people. It's, it's very much about, um, okay, I could see you, you've got a, a rotator cuff injury, so I could see you three times in the gym or we can get you started at work for two hours a day doing some lighter alternative work. We can get back in there to help preserve your job. And quite often our clients' roles are at risk when they're referred to us. Um, we can get you um, back into your, see your work colleagues, getting back into that routine, waking up at the same time every day, going to work. It's that whole, all of those routines that tie into things outside of work. And uh, to help people back to work, it's more sustainable, cost-effective, and better for the client if they're at work than they're in a gym with someone. So that tends to be the way that we all operate. So really, um, OTs and physios, it's all very, it's very blended here, like I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Anita, just coming back to you, uh, you, you getting, you're very lucky uh, on your last placement, um, being offered the job, a job, in your last place. You just want to tell us a little bit about um, the area in which you're working now. Sure. So um, I am currently employed at Otago Youth Wellness Trust here in Dunedin, uh, and I'm employed as a caseworker. Um, at the moment, I'm the only OT uh, caseworker here. So I work mostly with social workers. There are also a few nurses um, that are employed as caseworkers. And we work with rangatahi between the ages of 12 and 24, although mostly it's around that uh, 13 to 17 age group, maybe even 13 to 16. Um, and oftentimes these rangatahi will have um, anxiety or trauma, um, there might be um, things like FASD um, so, um, or ADHD, uh, sometimes it's a combination of all of those things. Um, and I, I guess as an OT in the role, uh, much like Sam has said, I'm, I'm glad to have that lens. I'm glad to be able to um, look not just at the person, but having a look at what they want to do and, and the environment that they're trying to do that in, and working in a client-centered perspective. Um, I love working, love working with um, social workers. Um, it's, it's, um, I find that they too are, are really client-centered. It's a really collaborative environment. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I just think I'm sitting here, you know, when you've described who you're working with now, and I'm thinking, okay, because, um, you know, when you, you go to a place and there's somebody who's, the, uh, who's qualified the same as you, same profession, you start role modeling, you start looking at what, how they do things, you think, oh, I'll do that. Uh, but you haven't got a role model there. So it, it you're, you're inventing occupational therapy in, in the place that you're working at the moment so you know what about that role model that that person you oh, um oh, oh let me I'll, I'll clarify my um my supervisor here as an ot she's just oh. no longer a caseworker um and um, hopefully we'll have a few more OTs in here. So the, some of the staff here have worked with OTs before, so they have a fairly good idea um, about what we're, we're about. Um, and in particular, just what I find really interesting is there's, um, there's a lot of interest in sensory modulation um, for um, emotional regulation, which is something that um, many of the rangatahi struggle with here. So coming in as a new grad, that's, that's been um, both exciting and challenging. Um, Sam, you'll know we, we do get some training on sensory modulation, but coming into a job and going, yep, here's the OT, 
do it okay. right. <laughs> as a whole other story so the first I luckily because I did my placement here I was able to to kind of do a lot of the legwork early on um, and I certainly am, am reaching out to as many other OTs um, within the area here and um, some of my um, old tutors or ex-tutors I should say that have, have gone on to work in the field I've been able to reach out to them and I've had lots of support um, and, and any questions I have. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you identify as Maori? Um, I, I do, yep. So on my dad's side, I'm English Croatian, and on my mum's side, I'm Ngati Maniapoto uh, from the King Country. Right. Yes. So tell me, we, we, we know we've got a bicultural um, competence, competency too, practicing appropriately for bicultural Aotearoa. Uh, and as somebody who identifies as, as Maori, do you view the world or the practice of occupational? therapy different to say maybe Sam who doesn't mm. identify as Maori mm. do, you, do you see things differently oh I think Sam and I would need to have a discussion to be able to answer that question <laughs> accurately I would would not like to presume how Sam views the world mm. that's a pretty mm. big question I know what you're mm. alluding to though Andrew and mm. I guess I can answer that by saying I am I am absolutely passionate about mm. helping rangatahi Māori um, mm. because the statistics are just so high. It, it mm. is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and certainly the interactions that I've had with whānau here, they, they embrace having um, a, a, a caseworker that, that is Māori and we need more of them. So um, to the Māori OTs that are watching this coming on board, kia tere. <laughs> Hurry up, come along, you'll need it. Um, and um, I, 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 I'm privileged to be in those homes. Uh, as you can tell, I, I still get uh, really emotional. Um, and just, um, I'm not sure, you're probably aware of this, Andrew, um, and I'm not sure about you, Sam, that we have a tangata whenua hui um, usually on an annual basis. So that's, that's specifically for Māori OT to come together in a really safe place and, um, and be able to bring our view really safely. That, and maybe it is different, um, and, but, but more so than thinking that it's a different view, it's just somewhere, I guess, it's a safety net for us. Um, for, for me personally, even though I grew up rurally, I feel like an urban Māori. Um, I didn't grow up um, <laughs> learning te reo. Um, although my mum taught me lots of tikanga, it was more innate than um, something that was, you know, that I, that I realised was being Māori. So what I'm trying to say there is, uh, I think many Māori, like myself, that feel urban Māori, um, struggle, struggle to um, to feel safe, and 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 within that we we see and we feel that our clients don't feel safe. So I maybe that's the answer to the question that I am super protective. And when I come in, particularly with Māori clients, I really say I really go back to the basics of that whaka whanaungatanga. And that can't be underestimated just how important it is to, to make those connections, to build that really slowly, and to look for all the things that... Um, that others might miss, like, do they have kai? Can they, do they have petrol money to make it to the appointment? If they're not making it to the doctor, why aren't they going to the doctor? It's not that they're lazy. It's not that they don't care. It's not, you know, there's lots of other reasons. So I, that, that's the view that I, that I hold. Kia ora, thank you, Anita. Thanks for that. Thank you for sharing that. That's really good. It's, it's super 
cool because like so many would would see coming into the setting like you have done and I know your your supervisors had a, a change in role she's not case managing as as you're doing now is that right Anita? That's correct. She's she is kind of in that managerial administ administrative role. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what I yeah, it, so many people would adjust so differently to that. But you're you're in a position now with the passion that you have and the client group that you're working with. Like you're you're in such a position to completely thrive. It's it's great that you. It's almost like a benefit that you've got so much room to grow. Like as the only T, only OT in that setting, like. You're, sort of, you're really set to blaze a bit of a trail. And especially if you can kind of define, like here, myself, like APM, I think, are one of the biggest employers of OTs outside the DHB in New Zealand, I'm quite sure. The role is very, like, there are very firm structures around what I can, and, 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 like the limits of how I'm kind of operating. Um, within, within your role, and I've seen other graduates coming out of my year group that have gone into roles such as yours, like some of the most successful, ha happy in their job, um, like OTs that are really making a difference are ones like you that have gone into these settings and, and find themselves in maybe the only position in their team that are OTs. Um, sky's the limit, hey? Yeah, and uh, you know, I do credit to the culture here like where I'm working, I'm I feel I do feel really lucky, Sam. I do. I do, but I um I'm really well supported um in terms of that bringing that bicultural lens and applying that um but also to bring that OT lens here. It's um it, it's it's a it's a lovely place to work and yeah. Hopefully it, it, yeah, I'm loving it so far. <laughs> <laughs> so um Coming to the end of, of our discussion now, conversation, I just want to turn to each of you in, in turn and say, what advice would you give to somebody following in your shoes? So, Anita. Mm. Uh, I guess what I found the most useful is to bring myself that um, to, to the job to everything that you, that therapeutic use of self mm. is uh, not to be underestimated, uh, bring your own skills. Um, so I, for example, I am a Māori weaver. So I try to incorporate that into my mahi. Um, whatever you have, whatever your passions are, whatever your, um, you know, figure out what you like to do and, and what your strengths and weaknesses are and work to that and you'll, you'll likely end up in a job that suits you because OT has a really wide scope to, mm, to absolutely. facilitate yeah. that. Just an additional comment I'd make around, you know, I applaud the, the use of the uh, therapeutic self to bringing that to your, to your position, to the job, Mahi, that you, you do. But I think that has to be backed up with support so to bringing yourself to a job op by definition opens you up. And therefore I think, you know, it, it's good, mm -hmm. it's authentic and honest use of self, but I think also that that opens you up and you need to have some supportive networks around you for when, you know, things go wrong, mm -hmm. you, you know, th things are challenging uh, because it's personalized. It, it is you, mm -hmm. authentic to you. So I think the importance of supervision um, in those sorts of, you know, that sort of approach to practice is really important. Mm. But what, what about you, Sam? What advice would you give to somebody um, following in your shoes? Mm. Um, I would, um, I'll just reiterate, look, really, especially starting off in your first year, just keep your expectations on yourself to keep your expectations on yourself realistic you are you are you are entering a very new and uncharted territory just mm -hmm. like come back to why you picked this profession in the first place like come back to those core values you picked ot for a reason like you are there for a reason you and back yourself don't don't um you will be put in very new and unfamiliar situations where it's very quite tempting like for Anita's example before with the sensory modulation and having suddenly having to be put in a situation where you're solely responsible for delivering that to a client 
like instead of the, the tempting option might be to chirk away and say, look, I'm new to this, I'm way out of my depth, but you, you almost really, when you're in a client facing role, don't have the luxury of saying I'm new. It's, it's, it's sink or swim. And, and if that, if you're handed those two options, swim, you'll, you'll, you will, um, might surprise yourself. Okay. Thank you. Finally, a couple of words now. What is your hope for the profession of occupational therapy in, in the future? Start with Sam. What do you hope for the profession? If you can speak for the whole profession, be careful now. Three, you're speaking on behalf of over 3,000 people. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that if, if we can um, get the recognition that we need as a profession, not to um, to, to exclaim to yourself that you're an occupational therapist and perhaps not get a quizzical look and response. I'm not. I'm not. Oh, but truly, I'm not too too um, concerned with with how other people perceive us. I think it's more important by how we perceive ourselves. You know, how how what what direction we want us to take ourselves. And I think like what Anita was talking about before about the the incredible disparity in health statistics between. Um, NZ Europeans and um, Māori and Pacifica, all sorts of minority ethnic groups, we have got so much work to do. And quite excitingly, I think that we're genuinely one of the best professions that are equipped to be able to address a lot of these issues. We are, we are not, I am really proud to represent a profession that I'm not trying to sell, sell dysfunction or sell sickness or diagnosis to people. I'm telling them to get up and, and take a stand, move on with their lives, get active, do stuff. It's it's something that I, I'm incredibly proud of and I think everyone should be. Thanks, Sam. Anita, all of that. Yeah, total <laughs> good. Can't fight. Yep, totally agree. Um, yeah, I think too, and too, you'd mentioned it also, Andrew, that... Um, yeah, oftentimes people don't even know what an OT is. <laughs> so it would be nice to kind of looking forward to the future that um, people understand our roles a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't really have much to add to what Sam said. Okay. Well, thank you for taking the time to have a conversation with us. Um, thank you for your honesty and uh, and you know, being upfront about what it's been like for somebody who's starting in a role, and somebody who's just coming into their approaching that end of their second year in that role. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaki Tiano, and uh, uh, have a good holiday season. And uh, yeah, all the best for your uh, career. I acknowledge your energy. I really do, and I you know hope that that energy gets fed. <laughs> uh, okay. Kakiti. Sure. Kakiti. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Kakiti. Nice to meet you. You too. Bye. Bye bye.